Boy, howdy. It is a beautiful, beautiful day outside and an honor to be able to worship God with each of you this morning. What wonderful songs that Paul has led us in. What a blessing that is to be able to come as we are in this place and to be able to worship together our great God who loves us so much. We finished up last week looking at that series of lessons in which we had been examining concerning the moral issues that we must be mindful of and watch out for, that we must put to death, as Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 says, those uh, immoral things as Christians that we can get caught up in to be that which is Christ-like in our lives. And as I was thinking about that, and, and as is oftentimes the case, when I finish up a series of lessons and kind of get ready for uh, that which I'm preparing for the next. I go through a list of those uh, sermons that every preacher has of uh, someday getting at or maybe scribbles that were written down. Uh, in my case, as you guys know me in electronics, I have a note there where I, I think of these things and kind of as I go throughout the day or hear something, put those in it. And today we're going to look at one of those based off Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. What is our, or what our work is? What is it that we as the church, those who have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation, what is it that God expects from us as a whole? What is it that is our duty, our work, our goal? Again, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 makes it clear that we are His, that's God's, that's Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And of course, we all remember there, Ephesians 2 and verse 8 and 9 there, where Paul says we're saved by grace through faith. And so it's in connection with salvation then that the apostle writes there to, uh, to the church at Ephesus. And he says, listen, we have a job that we are to do. We're not just saved and then told to do nothing, are we? God didn't come to this earth for the removal of our sins and to do all that he did for us to do nothing after that, but sit back and, and just hope for eternity. No, we were created for good works. But what does that mean? As the church, one of the number one responsibilities we have in the workmanship of God, in which we were created for, of course, is to teach the laws. We, of course, love coming together as we are. We enjoy this opportunity that we have. In fact, from what we can read of heaven, these are the most... Uh, uh, correlating opportunities to that which heaven will be like when those who are faithful and true get there one day. These are our times where we get to worship our Creator, our God, through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and studying His Word, and in fellowship with each other. And it is a great thing, but as we know, we're, we go outside those doors, don't we? To a world that's lost. To a world that's dealing with the tragedies of sin, like we all know. None of us are immune to it. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all deal with those realities of the corruption that sin has brought into this world. The difference between though outside and inside is that we have tasted that of the beauty of Christ in our lives. We know the joy that can be had in this life. Even with all the chaos and even with all the sin and even with Satan and all that's going on and the things of this world. That we can, as Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul, right there, there in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, was in prison at that time. Saying rejoice. Why was he saying that? Because he knew the reality of the joys of Christ. Paul, a man who understood the suffering of sin, calling himself the chief sinner, didn't he? Knew what it meant to be saved by God's grace through faith and the plan of salvation. 
I heard it said one time concerning teaching the laws, it's one beggar teaching another beggar about bread. And when you think about that reality, it is truly what it is. We remember what Jesus said concerning himself there in John 6 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. All of us, Romans 3, 23, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us know what it's like to have reached the age of accountability, to know what it means to miss the mark of righteousness and the weight and reality of that. But those of us who have tasted of the bread of life, that is Jesus, know a weight that can be lifted in a weight that is lifted from our lives. We have a responsibility as the workmanship of God. As those created, again, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for good works to tell as many people as possible about the love of Christ, about the joy that can be found in Him, and the wonder it has done in our lives. It's no wonder that Jesus, before he ascends into heaven and is there that very last day with his disciples would say this, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus said, listen, this message is too important for you to hold on to it to yourselves. This message of salvation and the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ is too much for one to keep to themselves. Again, we see the parallel to this in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. <clears throat> Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus told the apostles there, listen, the things that I have taught you and the things that the, at this time the Holy Spirit was going to come down as their helper and, and help them proclaim and help them understand and know. He says, go out and teach. Teach them my love. Teach them my word. Teach them my expectations. Teach them that I will be with them always, even to the end of the age. I think we see a really powerful illustration of this in Acts chapter 8. When Philip, of course, had been preaching and teaching in the Holy Spirit, and being God knew that there was this Ethiopian eunuch who had been in Jerusalem. And he was traveling all the way back to Ethiopia on this trip. And, and, and the Holy Spirit said, listen, there is someone I need you to go and to talk to. In Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> remember verse 30, we read this, we're starting then verse 30. So Philip ran to him, that being the eunuch there, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that, was, uh, that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb. Before this year is silent, so he opens his mouth. Of course, you and I know this is Isaiah chapter 53. And in verse 33 there of Acts 8, it says, In his humiliation, his humbleness, in other words, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? He said, who is this about? Who is this one who was denied? Who is this one who's the lamb led to the slaughter? Who is this one who would take on the sins of the world? And Philip, in verse 35, opened his mouth and began with that scripture, with this scripture. He told him the good news or the gospel about Jesus. And of course, as you and I know, when the chariot or the, that which they were riding in came across water, he said, what hinders me from being baptized? Just as Jesus had said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He said, what hinders me from being saved? And of course, the eunuch said, nothing, let's get this done. And the eunuch went away rejoicing. And all the craziness that goes on in this life, and here's a man who's a eunuch, 
Here is a man of high status, no doubt, to be in the position he is just simply to be allowed back to Jerusalem. But nevertheless, he goes away rejoicing on the way back. The gospel is for all, isn't it? As the church, it is our number one responsibility to let as many people know of the love God has shown us in our lives. The sins he has forgiven us in our lives and the strength he gives us to fight that good fight of faith. Of the young congregation there of 1 Thessalonians, remember the history there where Paul had been a part of helping that congregation get started. And there was an uproar amongst the Gentiles in that area and some of the Jews that were in that area and they caused this big uproar and even thrown uh, Paul in, in, in prison. And, and some of the men, Jason and others, had gone to get him free, as was the custom of that time. They didn't really want to keep Paul at that point and, and the expenses that went with it. They just simply wanted a, a large sum of money. And so some of the members gathered together and they went and they, they what it appears, paid that fine, if you will, the bail, if you will, for Paul. But one of the conditions was, of course, Paul had to leave. Thessalonica. And here in 1 Thessalonians, about six months later after the church has had its beginning, and the church there is, is going about, Paul is a sent for word about how this congregation, we know Paul's love for everyone that he was associated with and in contact, and even those like the church in Colossae he didn't, but he had heard about. Paul had sent to hear what was going on, how they were doing. Again, there was great persecution when he left, and he knew it hadn't stopped. And he hears this report in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 of the church there at Thessalonica, who's six months old. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Paul says, listen, you're... You're impressive as a congregation, this young congregation who had its struggles, sure, like every other congregation. If we didn't need Christ still in the church, then we would be perfect, and without the blood, certainly we're not. We still sin. But the church in Thessalonica knew the importance of making sure that the word got out, that they had heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and that though the persecution was around them and though people were trying to stop it, they wanted people to know the love of Christ, the gospel. They wanted people to hear the good news of Jesus. That in their lives, that it didn't matter what happened in this life, there was another life prepared. That even when things got tiresome and difficult and challenging, that they could still continue to go on and wake up every day that, that, God, that God has allowed us to live in this life to make it to the next because there is a next life. In fact, one of the problems with Thessalonica, one of their issues, if you will, was that they were actually worried they had missed Christ coming back. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in fact, Paul, he, he comments on that and reassures them that, no, you haven't missed it. Christ hasn't come back. You just keep fighting the good fight of faith. And he ends in verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians 5 saying, encourage one another with these words. Know then of the love of God and the power of his gospel. What is our work as a church is to tell as many who will listen of what God has done in our lives. How his blood and his sacrifice, as we memorialized in the Lord's Supper this morning, has had an impact on us. And that no matter what our health is like or our work is like or our family life might be, with Christ on our side, as Paul stated, who can be against us if God is for us? And so we see that the work of the church is to tell as many people as possible, first and foremost, of that which we know and that which we have found to be true and heard and obeyed and know the blessings of. That each day we wake up knowing the realities of this life, but the blessings of the next, and the joy that can be found in that. What's another work the church is responsible for? What's another work that we as the church must 
be prepared for and understand that God expects from us. Not only must we teach the lost, but we must be benevolent in our lives. We must help those that are outside those doors. It is a responsibility of us. In fact, it's how, again, we can maybe begin to have an impact on others' lives is when we certainly go outside these doors and we communicate the love of God through not only the word of Christ, but our actions. How we treat people. How we help people. You've heard me say before, it was we have many secular writings from the Romans. And many of their governors and others would get upset with, with Christians because they were known for taking care of the widows and the orphans. They were known for taking care of those who were uh, dealing with physical and mental problems. They were known for being benevolent and helping others who they considered a dredge on their society and a weakness to the empire, but Christians saw as someone who needed love, as someone who needed the gospel. It feels good, no doubt, to help others. Jesus, remember, declared, we're told there in Acts 20 and verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, don't get me wrong. It does feel good to help others, but it's not always easy. The challenges of those who are dealing with the things of sin and don't know the love of Christ. As many of us, no doubt, can look back to or remember can lead to so many uneasiness and reality of struggles. Those in need often struggle with the realities of the choices that have been made and the consequences of them. The Apostle Paul certainly felt this. Remember when he first became an apostle. After on that road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, when Jesus himself became or showed himself in a vision to Paul, that great light, and said, why are you kicking the goads? Why are you fighting me, Paul? And then three days later, after not eating or drinking and being blinded by what had happened to him, remember, Ananias came to him and he taught him the gospel. And Paul obeyed the gospel, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 says. When Ananias said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. But what does Paul say he did? He immediately went out and started preaching Jesus. But when he got to Jerusalem, notice, he had only seen Peter first, and Barnabas had to bring him. Why? They were scared of him. He had murdered their friend, Stephen. He had consented and helped throw their friends and their friends' wives and children in prison for being Christians. Even Ananias, we remember, was scared to go to him. But there was that one man, Barnabas. A man of encouragement who saw this one who he had heard great things have been done in Damascus and the things he had been preaching and maybe even of what he had done in Arabia when he was down there for three and a half years. And he went down and he took him and brought him to see others. He was benevolent to him. Now Paul, no doubt at that point, was a Christian. But the way we impact people's lives through our means and, and ways, whether through, it's through encouragement, financially, emotionally, we have an impact, don't we? And when we go outside those doors, people need to know that we understand that what we have and what we know isn't just ours, it's for everyone. And that people need to hear the love of God and see it in the way we act and the way we do in our lives. Now, we have to go out and we should be benevolent. There are three things when we do this that must be kept in mind, of course. When we're helping others and we're helping those around us, outside those doors, these things must be kept in mind. First, when we do for others, we're remembering or we must remember that it is for Christ. Christ makes it very clear, doesn't he? In Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 and 35, 
talking of himself here when he said, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed to my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And of course, we see the response to the king. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you, Jesus, hungry, and feed you, and thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, true, or truly, I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When we go outside those doors, or as we'll talk about here in a moment, help those of our own brothers and sisters. When we're doing that, it's not just for them. It's not just to them. Jesus, who is creator of all things, John 1 and verse 1, which means creator of every single person, says you do it to him. And how we recognize that and think about our benevolence, our helping others, must always keep that in mind. The second thing, when we're helping someone with those physical things, our focus must be on the spiritual. Yes, we need to help in areas of, of need in our community. We need to help people who uh, need some food, help them with food as we've done, or gas as we do. Maybe even pay a bill here or there where we can. But that cannot be our focus because that's not what God wants us to do. Yes, he wants us to help and he wants us to be benevolent, but he wants that benevolence to have a goal, and that is, of course, that they hear God's love for them. All three of the works in which we're going to talk about all tie together in this way. In Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? If we feed someone and we give them, make them full, or we fill up their gas tank, or we do any of these things, but we don't talk to them about God, what good is it truly to them? Yes, for a moment, it helps. Yes, for a second, it helps. But in this blip of time that we're given, that help is momentary. When we go to help someone who is in need, we must do so, and it's good for us to help. Where we can and how we can as good stewards of God. But the righteousness of Christ and his love for others must be the forefront. The third thing we need to remember when we are talking about benevolence is we are not to enable sin. We have to be careful here. Sometimes our hearts can be bigger than our minds in these areas. And sometimes we can accidentally end up enabling, as stewards of God, through benevolence, sin. And if we are enabling sin to take place, then we will answer for that because we're not helping them. We're only hindering their walk or eventual walk with God. As Christians, we must use wisdom when it comes to being benevolent. We must understand that we'll not always get it right and there will be times where we make mistakes, most certainly. We don't have the knowledge of God to know the end from the beginning. But where we can and as we go, we must use prudence and wisdom because God has made us stewards of what he has given us he has put us in charge of that which is his to benefit his work as workmen for him and so when we are benevolent we must not only forget that we're doing this for Christ and to Christ that we're also doing this to help others who are in need and, and, and spiritually in need as well when we do this but we have to be careful that we don't overlook sin in the process Though Paul's not specifically talking about benevolence in that way in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2, the principle of it is done the same, or is the same. It is actually reported that there is fornication among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. 
for a man has his father's wife. Notice this, and you are arrogant, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now again, it's not dealing directly with the lost, obviously. These are those in the church. And he's not necessarily dealing with benevolence. But what he's saying is, is when we overlook sin, it's arrogance. That sin, no matter who is caught up in it, should make us mourn. Should make us weep because of the lost reality of the soul. When helping people in our community, we have to keep these, things, these three things in mind. But we also sometimes can forget in our efforts to help those in our community, we can sometimes forget helping our own brethren. I've seen it far too many times. Many times congregations spend a significant amount of time, money, and energy trying to help everyone outside those doors, which again is good and it has its place and it should be done. They have their, their community pantries and their food pantries and and I know some who have like addiction classes and, or, or classes to help those who are suffering with divorce or you, any number of things. And I'm not saying any of those are bad. No, many of them have great results and are doing good things. But they're not meant to look inward, but outward. And at the behest sometimes or at the reality of forgetting their own brothers or sisters. I know I've been guilty of it myself. You think, well, you've obeyed the gospel and you're trying your best and you're doing things and well, things just should work out. And, and, and we just think, well, everything's going to be fine always because we know Christ, we know his love and things like that. But we also sin, don't we? We also struggle. One of the greatest prophets to ever live, Elijah, who had been a part of one of the greatest events to ever take place, against Baal, the idol, and, and the comparison between the God and him as all his 400 prophets that were there that day died by God's hand and demonstrated God's power against the fake. And Elijah on a great high thinking how great it is that God has been seen and that his power has been met and surely these high places will be torn down and the idols will go away. And then he went and found as Jezebel sought him out to kill him and chased him away and he ran and he goes to God and says, I just want to die, I'm done. One of the greatest prophets ever to live said, I just want to give up. Sometimes in our own lives as Christians, we struggle. We have difficulties. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's emotional. But we have that and we need the benevolence of our brethren. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia there in chapter 6 and verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Notice this. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul said, don't forget your brothers and sisters next to you, behind you, in front of you. They need your encouragement. They need your help. They need your love. And maybe not as often and maybe not as in the same way. They still need it. It's easy to overlook those who are trying their best and those who are here all the time and those who are doing what appears to be the right thing always and, and, and have that. It, it can be easy to overlook them. We shouldn't. We need to know each other well enough to know when we're struggling. When we need help, we need to be humble enough to ask as individuals when we're struggling to seek that help. It shouldn't be a discouragement to need the benevolence of their family. Lastly, not only should we teach the laws to be benevolent to those outside those doors and inside, but we also need to be a people who are about edification. I know that word edification, we might not think of it in terms of training our replacements, but when it comes to the church, that's really what it is. The word edification literally means to build a house. The Greek word for edification, and why a lot of modern translations have to build up instead of saying to edify, is because it comes from the word that, again, breaks down, literally meaning to build a house. As Christians, 
We are to build each other up in the Lord. We are to edify, encourage, and strengthen each other. And that's not just the mature to the mature. No, in fact, the reality of that is, is that those who are mature in the faith have all the more responsibility to help those who are weaker in the faith or younger in the faith. That they may see the love of God and be encouraged and be built up all the more so that that continues generation to generation to generation. The book of Judges makes it very clear that within one generation, God can be forgotten. Not that there is a God, but how to follow him, obey him, love him, and do what is right and true and faithful and, and make it to an eternity with him. Within one generation, over and over and over, we see with the Jews uh, in, in their lives that uh, within one generation, that one generation that did not edify to the love of God and explain the beauties of faithfulness and build up their children and those that were younger. They grew up knowing not God. It's no wonder why the New Testament is filled with passages about edification or building each other up from one generation to another. The older are told to teach the younger. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Again, that word men there, faithful men is anthropos, meaning uh, mankind. You who are faithful, who know the word and are strong in the word, encourage and edify and teach. Entrust it to others so that they may be able to once again at another point do it also. We have a responsibility to build each other up in the word. We also have a responsibility to train each other in righteousness. To build each other up. What is right and true. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. Notice verse 6 that connects right here. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Paul tells Timothy, listen, you have to have the older men teach the younger men these things. You know what it is. You have to edify them and build them up in that. The older women to the younger was the same in verses 3 through 4. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children. The point is this. In the church, we have a responsibility, don't we? To edify each other. To build each other up and be there for each other. We do live in an old, simple world, a difficult world, a challenging world. But if we, Ephesians 4, verse 25, do what is good for building up, then from one generation to the next, the love of God will not only be known, but it will be felt, recognized, and seen. And the next generation will learn from the maturity of the previous. And the edification continues. Teaching the lost and being benevolent and edifying is vital to the expectations and work of the church. All of us are expected to do that. Again, it's not always easy. It's not always going to be simple and there's going to be difficult times and good times. That's the reality of the sinful world we live in and the challenges of it. But God has blessed us so bountifully so wonderfully. He has given us each that opportunity to spend a life with him after this life. And not just a lifetime, but an eternity, hasn't he? And to know that is the greatest joy one could have. So again, we read Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for we who know that love and have had our sins washed away are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. The reality of sin is, is that it separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And because of that, this world is chaotic, it's dangerous, it's difficult, it's challenging, isn't it? As we've said. But thankfully, Philippians chapter 2 Verses 6 and 7, the Father sends His Son 
to come to this earth to empty himself and to be born in the likeness of men so that he could, at his ascension, sit at the right hand of God and be my advocate and yours. That he can go to the Father and say, I know what it's like to be tempted and live like them. I know what it's like to ultimately suffer in the most terrifying ways and to give one's life for God in righteousness. That's our advocate. As we go about our walk with God and as we think about and study God's word, I hope you have that joy in your life. Maybe you need to sit down and study and examine it. Maybe there's an opportunity there to learn that, as Paul says there in Romans chapter 10, 17, to learn what faith is by getting into the Word. To learn who Christ is through His Word. It is the Word of Christ. To examine His love for us and examine what faith in Christ truly is, the blessing it is. To not only believe that God exists, but that He rewards those who seek Him. God wants everyone to be with him for an eternity. And if we're willing to repent and turn towards him, give our lives for him, if we're willing to make that great confession, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, notice this, therefore whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess for my Father who is in heaven. But he whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Our advocate is there to make that plea. And if we're willing to make that great confession, if we're willing to obey the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, knowing the dangers and the fear of God and the recognition that flaming fire and vengeance waste those who do not do so, if we're willing to obey the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to give our lives totally and completely to him, then we too, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, 3 through 5, can in the likeness of that gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, have our sins washed away, to walk in a newness of life, and then go about helping everyone else. To the best of our ability, do the same. So this morning, if you need the prayers of the congregation here, if you need us to encourage you and edify you and strengthen you, we don't know all the things that are going on, but let us do that. Let us be that benefit to you. Or if you would like to study God's Word closer, let us know this morning as we stand and as we sing.